It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and it's good to be among family. It is amazing to me, and, and uh, over 20 years ago, God began to bless us with the opportunity to go out of the country and go to other nations and other tribes and other tongues and other people. And uh, in, in many lands, I'm just kind of known as the ghost, you know. I come in there, and I'm chronically Caucasian. I'm, <laughs> I'm German, Irish, and English. I mean, I can't keep a tan more than a day. And so, you know, we go into some of the most beautiful cultures, the Indian people, the Ethiopian people. If you've seen Ethiopian people, some of the most beautiful people on earth. And I've been in remote villages that have no television, have no running water, have, you know, no bathrooms, obviously, and uh, 40, 50,000 people in villages that, uh, that don't know about the outside world. And uh, we take people there on the team, and, and people say, man, they're so poor. And we say, don't tell them. Because they don't know it. Everyone in the village is living the same life. But you know what? They've got a lot of things America used to have. Neighbors help neighbors. Amen. Families stay under the same roofs, you know, two and three generations. And uh, they have a lot of things that are very valuable in those lands. And, uh, and they're hungry for the word. And God is moving. I've seen young women in those villages that are tall and smooth of skin. And uh, just beautiful Ethiopian women. They could be runway models here. They don't even know there's a modeling industry. You know, uh, but God is moving around the world. God is moving wherever the Word of God is, is coming, wherever people are hungry. Don't ever believe uh, that you're a part of something that is losing a battle. Because I tell you this right now, God's already won. Amen. He's already won. The, the gospel, I mentioned, you know, um, which service was I in? You know, I mentioned the gospel did not come under the illusion of winning every soul. Uh, the gospel has come to reveal the hearts of men. Those that are of the light are going to come to the light. And you have that choice. You choose light or you choose darkness. And if you want darkness, then darkness is, is waiting there for you. But the awesome thing is that light always overcomes darkness. Right? And truth always overcomes a lie. And uh, so I'm grateful, you know, for what the Lord has done. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven comes not with observation. And uh, even today... You know, we look for clues that the kingdom is near. You know, we, we watch and we look and we see somebody, maybe they're physically reacting to the spirit or something that's being said, and we say, aha, the kingdom is here. But the kingdom of heaven does not come with observation. And the kingdom of heaven is not limited to being somewhere just when you can visibly tell that the kingdom is there. The kingdom of heaven is not limited to being in a place because you feel something. The kingdom of heaven is there. Amen. Amen. Whatever you feel and, and wherever you're at and whatever you're, you're going through, uh, you know, the kingdom of heaven has a king that is yet to be unthroned. Amen. And so the devil tried that. Lucifer, he was a worship leader, by the way. You've got to pray over your worship leaders, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's in charge in, in worship, and he brought glory to God and glory to God and glory to God. He became very beautiful. He became awesome. He became glorious. Himself, but what, what Lucifer, before he was Satan, what Lucifer forgot uh, was that when he saw the glory, when he saw the light that was emanating and, and, and bouncing off of him and all of this, that it was not his glory, it wasn't his light, that he was reflecting the glory of God, he was reflecting the light of God, standing in the presence of Jehovah God, he gets built up in pride. He begins to believe that he is the source of the, all of these giftings and all of these abilities that have been placed inside of him. And, and then he begins to go to the angels and tell them, hey, I believe I can overthrow this God. I mean, I'm so wonderful. <laughs> I'm so beautiful. I'm so talented. You know, I, I can overthrow this God. I can sit on his throne. And, and he said five I will statements, you know. And uh, I will, anytime we're beginning statements with I will, we better be very careful, Okay. And, uh, and he got off in the I will, and he said, I will ascend. I will sit on the throne. I will receive the glory. I'll do these things. The Lord told me in 2007, he said, do you not know that I, I knew when Lucifer went to the very first angel and said, hey, I'm going to overthrow God? He said, I knew it, but I allowed him to go to every one of those angels and because I, I allowed him to reveal their hearts. He said, Satan did not take one angel from me whose heart was with me. But he pulled those whose hearts was upon other things. And, and so even the kingdom of heaven suffered that violent act 
You know, now we, we're told, you know, to take it by violence or take it by force or take it on purpose. And the New Testament where you hear and see Jesus say receive, uh, the word there for receive is to take. It's, it's just take it. It's la, la, lambano, uh, L-A-M-B-A-N-O. And uh, I try to pronounce that Hispanic-like, and it's Greek, so I don't know. I've just crucified it. But, uh, you know, this word lambano, lambano, in, in the Greek means to take. He says, when you pray, believing, receive. So to us, receiving, you know, it's a department at the store or a department at the factory. There's a receiving department. Uh, Receiving is waiting on something to come. But in the kingdom, that's not what he's saying. When you stand praying, believing, take. Lambano, take, receive, take it. And, And so we take Uh, you know, from God, the very things that God has promised us. And the thing of it is, is that God is not going to force it on you. God's not going to force anything on you. So uh, he wants us to be takers, takers of what we believe. Uh, Where's where's the birthday guy? Yeah, right there. Comes in here. Oh, man, I'm having a birthday tonight. I'm getting old. You know, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. He said, I said, well, how old are you? You know, he says, 34. (laughs) I've got a Bible at home that's 36. (laughs) I do. I do. I got it when I was 16. And I'm about to turn 52. And uh, it's a mess. I mean, it's wore out. But but you're looking a lot better than my Bible, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that right now. But, you know, I mean, it's, I told him, I said, man, what you got to do is lay on your back and throw your arms up in the air and kick your feet and say, I'm only 34. I'm only 34. It's awesome. It's wonderful. I mean, I got you about 18 years, man. He was born in 81. I graduated high school in 81. Yeah. I'm looking good, right? Yeah. I mean, whew. I had to work for that one, didn't I? I mean, I had to beg for it and plead with it. I don't know how it is in Florida, but in Kentucky, most people turning 52, you cannot see their belt. And they haven't seen their feet in about 15 years. <laughs> I mean, we like mashed potatoes and gravy and turkey and roast beef and chicken, you know, all those wonderful things that's good for you. Anyway, I'm all over the place tonight. The, the problem that I'm with is that the Holy Spirit is messing with me tonight. He is messing with me. I came in here with three sermons in my Bible. And then he starts speaking a new thing to me, (laughs) you know, just something I didn't even bring, something I didn't even have. I mean, you know, he just loves to mess with you like that sometimes. And and that's why we have to follow the Spirit and and live in the Spirit. One of the things we pray for is for utterance. Uh, So many times in Pentecostal charismatic circles, when we hear utterance, we think of a tongue, a language, the utterance. And certainly there is an utterance to speak an unknown tongue. Uh, But utterance also applies... Uh, you know, to revelation word, and it applies to kingdom word. Uh, You can pray with an utterance even when you're praying in English, okay, because you begin to pray the purpose of heaven. You begin to pray what God is is sending forth out of you. You know, I remember one time at home, uh, I was walking the floor and and praying, and and this is Monday, right? I mean, you guys are all right. You're the radical Christians, right? Uh, Okay, I can talk a little while. Um, I was walking the floor and I was praying and, 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 you know, I was just doing some warfare and just praying and, and, and then it moved to worship and it moved to a gratefulness and thank, thankfulness and all of those things. And, and as I'm praying, you know, and I'm just walking the floor and I'm talking to the Lord, my wife had gone out with the kids and they were shopping and, I, and that's a, really good for my prayer life. And, uh, <laughs> and because my wife has taken up a, a great responsibility seriously to keep the economy of the U.S. rolling. She's really working hard for that. And she's a great woman. She's a professional shopper. She's awesome. Linda can bear witness to that. And, um, but I'm praying and I'm praying and all of a sudden I just begin to thank God and I thank God and I thank God. And, and, and out of my mouth it came this statement. I said, God, I want to thank you for the ring on my finger. And, and, and it came forth out of my mouth and then my hand was kind of like, Wait a minute, come back here. Wait a minute, what is, what did I just say? What, what came out of my spirit? I want to thank you, God, for the ring on my finger. 
And, and, and so, of course, I went to the Word. And I found the significance of that statement was this. In the Old Testament, the ring represents the signet ring of the king. It is authority. Amen. Remember, you know, in Esther's story, when Mordecai was given the ring of the king to write the order, the day that was meant to destroy the people of Israel, to destroy the Jewish people, uh, became a day for them to rise up and defeat their, their enemies. And so he had, it was, you know, from Haman. Remember Haman? He's a forefather of, forefather of Hamas. It's the same line in Hamas. And so they, they have a heart to destroy the Jewish people. And, uh, and that was his heart. But the king gave him, Mordecai, the ring. He wrote the order the way he saw it best for his people. And he signed it with the signet ring of the king. And so there's authority in that Old Testament signet ring. In the New Testament, the, the ring on my finger refers to relationship, refers to the father. Because, you know, like the prodigal son, there were two sons that was working that farm. But we also know when we read the story that there's many servants. There's many servants, there's many field workers and laborers that are out there. And in that day, the only way you really could distinguish between the sons and, and, and the servants when they're out working in the field was that the sons had a ring. They had a ring from the father. And so the servants were working for wages, the sons was working for inheritance. Mm, isn't that good? Just working for inheritance. The fields they were working was going to belong to them. It was a part of their inheritance. And so uh, I want to encourage you, you know, to develop in your prayer life and, and develop uh, in your, uh, you know, even when you speak to others. When, have you ever been at work or whatever and, and you just begin to speak to someone and you started telling them things that you did not know? You know, a word of knowledge. That begin to flow. And utterance is connected to that. And, and so, you know, there's times that we're praying our words, but there's times we can connect with the language of heaven and begin to pray the purpose of God and the kingdom of God and those things that he's doing at the time. And so uh, I've urged, you know, the young ministers in the church, and you've got a tremendous group of young adults in this church, I tell you. And then, you know, I look around and I see all the generations you know, the grandparents, the great-grandparents are here. The grandparents are here. The parents are here. The, children, the young adults are here, and the children of the young adults are coming up. I mean, it's awesome, and it shows the health of the church. Um, oh. He just loves this. I brought three. And so, before we came, I asked God, I said, I don't want to just have a series of services. Luke 18, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Always pray and not faint. You know, if we were getting early answers to our prayer, he wouldn't have had to say, and not faint. <laughs> if we prayed and it happened, it materialized, it just came, he wouldn't have had to say, and not faint. Persistent prayer. Prayer until something happens. We, at home, we call it push. Pray until something happens. Push, push. Pray until something happens. Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. I've met a few of those in this, these days. They're men of great responsibility and great authority. And there was, in a, there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying, avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, 
I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, this judge that is in this city doesn't regard God, doesn't regard man. But there's an elder woman that's wearing him out. (laughs) Wearing him out. She is demanding justice to be avenged of her adversary. It's very likely that the adversary was paying the judge, tipping the judge, encouraging the judge to see it his way. He would not avenge her of her adversary. And she kept coming back. She kept coming back. She kept coming back. I can see this man that does not fear God and does not fear man. Before he comes out of the judge's chambers, I can see him cracking open the door. Oh, there she is again. There she is again. She's back. She's back in this courtroom. What am I going to do about this woman? And so he says, "I, I will avenge her. Because she's wearing me out. She keeps on coming. She hasn't given up. She had a just cause. But she had to be persistent. She had the right motive, but she had to be persistent. This widow troubled him. But he said, I will avenge her. And then verse 6, the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Verse 7, he says, and shall not God. Avenge his own elect. No period. Right? Not a general statement. God says, Shall not God avenge his own elect? Which? He's about to specify. Who is he going to avenge? Who is he going to hear? Who is he going to move for? He didn't say, You know, and shall not God avenge his own elect? Period. Which? Which ones? Which ones of the elect? Those which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Though he bear long with them. And then Jesus says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now wait a minute, you just said he will bear long with them. And now he says, and I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Or really, as you word study this and look at this, he's, he's saying this. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find this kind of faith. This kind of faith on the earth. This kind of faith. And so... How, if God is bearing long with us, how does he answer us speedily? It's kind of like uh, in the upper room in the book of Acts. Uh, You may, you may may not know that they tarried for the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was coming. Okay, the fire falling, the Holy Spirit speaking through tongues, and the wind blowing did not create the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is a very old feast of the Jews. It's thousands of years old. It is a feast of the harvest. It's it's there to celebrate the harvest. And so because it is Pentecost, uh, and then, of course, before that was Passover, uh, you know, you get about 40 days earlier as Passover. And so the Jewish people will pilgrimage Uh, to the land from all over the known world, all all over the world that was available at that time, to be a part of Passover, and then they would stay with family and and things uh, until Pentecost. And so uh, the disciples had been told, 500 had seen Jesus ascend. 500 people saw a man step on a cloud and go to heaven. Have you ever seen such a thing? When things are floating through the air, it's mesmerizing. You fill up balloons, you know, with helium, and and you attach a message to it or whatever. 
and you release these balloons, and there's just something that makes you one. I still see one. Man, it's so little, I can barely see. See that dot, that dot right over there? Yeah, and somebody else, where, 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 where? I still see one. Something mesmerizing about that. These guys have stepped up. Jesus has stepped on a cloud. He's been crucified. He's raised from the dead. He's eaten with them. The last thing Jesus says before he steps on the cloud is that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Right? That you may be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The last thing he said before he got on the cloud. When you're going on a trip, the last thing you're saying is vital. Remember, you know, remember to keep the water dripping at night so it doesn't freeze. Um, That's what I told my wife. And so... You know, it, it's something important that you're saying because you're getting ready to, to go. And so Jesus says, you're going to receive power. And, and you're going to be witnesses, power to become a witness. Thank God the Holy Spirit is more than power to jump up and down. Right? I mean, it's, I thank God for all of the measure of the Holy Spirit. But we, we've been given, empowered to become a witness. And in all of the world. And so Jesus steps on a cloud and he goes and and he tells them, you know, of course, he's already told them, return to Jerusalem and wait because I'm going to send you this gift from heaven. So I'm going off to heaven and I'm going to send you a gift back. I'm going to just call air freight and send this thing down and, and get it over to you. All right. And so 120 people wait. Mercy sakes. We get frustrated that we can't get a crowd to come consistently to the house of God. 500 people saw a man get on a cloud and float in the air to heaven, and only 120 of them were changed. Only 120 of them obeyed him. 380 were misplaced. All right, I'll be brutal. 380 were disobedient. So Jesus said, I'm going to send uh, the, the Holy Spirit uh, to you. And, and this, they, they tarry in Jerusalem for 10 days, 120 people. And then when the Holy Spirit came, it didn't drift in. There didn't come an ounce and then four ounces and then 10 ounces. When the Holy Spirit came, he came all at once. And so that's the way Jesus is speaking about this scripture. I mean, when the Holy Spirit came, the wind blew, the fire fell, the languages came because they had people from around the globe there, and he gave them the languages to speak it. Jesus said, I say that that the Father will avenge them speedily. Though he bear long with them, I say that I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. In other words, when the moment of victory comes, it comes. When the breakthrough comes, it comes. March 6, 1994, we had uh, come in from our Sunday evening services and had had a good day. It was a good day. I was early, uh, a young pastor at Church of the Living God in Winchester. And uh, we had come in. I remember I was sitting in the recliner. And, uh, you know, we're, um, I was thinking about the day, and uh, it was a good day. And uh, that's, I love that. There's a scripture in the Bible that said it was a good day, you know. And I love sitting back as a pastor being able to say it was a good day. And it was. It was a good day. So sit there for a little while, and it was getting kind of late, and the phone rang. Phone ringing in a pastor's home late at night is not good. It's, it's just not good. And so my wife was going to get the, vo- the phone, and I got out of my recliner to go get my shoes, my coat, because I was quite sure at that hour I was going somewhere. And I could tell as my wife was talking on the phone that it was urgent. It was critical. And uh, I pulled my coat. She hung up the phone. I said, where am I going? Who is it? What's going on? And I was not prepared for her answer. My 18-year-old baby brother had been in a car wreck. My brother. Yes, I was going to the hospital 
but not as pastor. She said that uh, he had to be airlifted by helicopter to University of Kentucky. We were told it didn't look good. Get up there as soon as possible. That's about all I knew at the moment, but I'm telling you, I set some records getting there. Just went urgently to the hospital. I walked into the emergency room, and there was a nurse standing there. And She said, Hall family? I said, yes. She said, this way. Not good. When you're not sitting among the general people waiting. She takes us to a private family room. Not good. And so my, uh, my father was parking the car. He was just getting, getting there. My sister, uh, two of my sisters were already in the room. And... Uh, the family began to gather, and then a physician's assistant, a sur- surgical assistant, came in to talk to us. They said, here's what we got. Eric came here by helicopter from his car accident. He had gone through a, a horse farm fence, a plank fence. Have you ever seen those beautiful plank fences throughout central Kentucky? His car had gone through a plank fence. A part of the plank came through the windshield, and it it tore up the plank, and it sent projectiles flying through the air. A piece of the plank that big around, a piece of wood that big around, that long, hit above his right eye and went into his brain. Into his brain. He arrived at the hospital with a stick, a plank sticking out of his head. His, His skull, of course, was fractured. Uh, They were in open brain surgery. Not good. (laughs) And so when everyone had gathered, and then um, I had a friend, a pastor friend from Lawrenceburg, I'd made a quick call to. uh, He came in and, and another. They moved us to another waiting room, and they said, this is your waiting room. We're not going to allow anyone else here. It's bad. It was eternity that night. It's a long, long night. But the break of the day, Dr. Deborah Blades walked into our our waiting room. And uh, she said, I've made an incision from his eyebrow in a loop back behind his right ear. I had to take part of the skull and, and lay that aside and go into this place of injury. She said, I had a... I had a big stick. I had a piece to pull out of his brain. Uh, she said we had splinters uh, in, in, intermingled in brain tissue, uh, which could produce infection, which brain infection is very critical. A stick in the head is very critical. Uh, they said we really don't know how that he survived the impact. He should have died As soon as it hit, he should have been gone. He happened to have happened to have the accident in front of a home of a husband and wife paramedic team. Uh, They quickly assessed the situation and called for the helicopter. Urgent help was there within minutes because of this happenstance. Um, She said, I have taken, of course, the stick out. I have removed a chunk of the frontal lobe of his brain. And she said, I have put the piece of the skull back. And uh, we've got two great enemies. It is infection and brain swelling. She said, in brain swelling, we have, in, in a head trauma, from 48 to 72 hours after the trauma is generally when the greatest swelling of the brain comes. She said, we have three lines. Fortunately, we are already using our last line. Uh, It was a medicine called pentobarbital at that time. They've got newer medicines, certainly, these days. They had told us that they could give him up to 250 milligrams of pentobarbital. Anything above that could put him in a medicine-induced coma that he could never come out of. And so uh, the morning had come, and it was icy outside. And um, 
one of my key men from the church had come in. And uh, we asked, I asked them when I could see my brother. I asked my family if I could go back and see him first because I wanted to, whew, wanted to uh, make an adjustment. I wanted to be able to be strong for my father, for my sisters, you know, for the people. And so Ray and I went back to the, uh, in t- the neurosurgery <laughs> intensive care. When you're going in there, ha- they have a paper that has kind of crude drawings of all of these machines that can be on your patient. And they circle the ones that you're going to find on the wall behind your patient. They circled the whole page. Everything they had was at work with my brother. When we went back there, they introduced us to a tube that was coming out of his head. And uh, that tube also had a monitor with it. And we were introduced to the ICP number. And it's the intracranial pressure. You and I today, likely, you know, you're healthy. You know, you're walking around. You probably have an ICP of 12. They said it's very vital that the ICP number does not get above 20. The intracranial pressure must not get above 20. Okay. And so... Uh, Eric looked relatively well. I was surprised how well that he looked. His head was wrapped from here out, so we didn't see the the wound itself. And the tube was coming out. Nothing else in his body was broken. Nothing else was bruised. If the if if the stick had gone by his head into the air, his biggest problem would have been telling Dad he wrecked the car. Two other young people in the car unharmed. Freak accident. Okay. So we begin to wait, and we begin to wait, and, and I don't have time to give you every detail uh, of this story, and I, but somebody needs to hear this story. On Tuesday, my mother had come in from Ohio with her husband, and uh, Dr. Blades was coming to give us a little bit of an update. My mother said to Dr. Blades, she said, uh, could you give me a 10% chance that my son is going to survive his injuries? And Dr. Blade said, I'm sorry, I cannot give that to you. And she said, would you give me a 5% chance that my son would survive these injuries? And Dr. Blade said, I'm sorry, I cannot give that to you. Very professional, very, at this point, you know, very um, detached. And I can't imagine what these people go through. And then mom looked at her and she said, could you give me a 1% chance that my son is going to survive the injuries that he has suffered? And Dr. Blade said, I'm sorry. I'm not able to give you that. So mom said, what is the prognosis? Dr. Deborah Blades looked at us and said, the prognosis is death. And she walked out of the room. And so into Tuesday, we get into the 48-hour time span, Tuesday into Wednesday. And his brain began to swell further. Although they were using the last line of defense that they had, the brain swelling came on with a vengeance. His eyes dilated and fixed. Uh, brain tissue was seeping out around his ear where just a small, you know, any little opening, brain tissue began to swell out. And um, they, they were giving him 250 milligrams of pentobarbital uh, they went to uh, 500, they went to 750, they went to a gram, they went to 1,000 milligrams of pentobarbital, not even sure that uh, they wouldn't kill him in the process. And so the fight was on for Tuesday and Wednesday and, uh, and, and into Thursday. It was rough, folks. I mean, it's rough, okay? You don't walk around with the towel and I'm pastor, man, this is your, your brother. This is your family. This is, this is a, you know, it, it's, it's brutal. I mean, we're all human, aren't we? And uh, Thursday was a, a bad day. Now, it's, the scene is a, uh, it's a circus. He's a senior in high school. He's, uh, Eric was adopted, and he's six foot four. We uh, brought him into the family to breed off a tall line of halls. <laughs> so it's been successful. He's got three children, and, and they're all, you know, they're, his son's six six, you know. And so you know how the story ends, I just told you. Um, but he, he had also signed, had just enrolled in the Marines to become a Marine Corps pilot, jet pilot. He was very intelligent, had top grades, all of those things. He was going to be graduating in June. And so the, the high school's there. 
Kids from youth camp went to youth camp with them. They're there. You know, all of this circus is going on. And you just want to stand up and say, go home. You know, let us, let us come through this. On Thursday, a friend of mine, a, a minister that's a G minister now, but he came up under our ministry in Danville, Kentucky. He came through the area. He had just heard what had happened. And he, as a matter of fact, he stopped at my pastor's house and visited there. And there he found out, came back to University of Kentucky Hospital. And he came in. We're in the waiting room. And I mean, it's like a funeral home. And we weren't the only ones that were suffering. Every day, you're not there. Somebody is there. Somebody's there. And, uh, and he said, let's get out of here. And he took me downstairs to the cafeteria area. And, and uh, I'm, I'm 31 years old. Okay. I'm just a kid myself. 34. Yeah. I'm old. So how young you are just to say that, you know. And John looks at me and he says, you got to fight this. He said, you got to fight this. And I looked at him. I said, John, don't be cheap. Don't come in here four days later and be cheap with me. I said, you haven't seen the doctors. You haven't heard the reports. I said, don't come in here flippantly and act like this is some little pushover thing. I said, this thing, this thing is bad. This thing's bad. And in my mind throughout the week, I had a continuing thought rotating. I remember when mom came in. She said, Tommy, why did this happen to Eric? I said, mom, he ran off the road. He went through a plank fence. A piece of the plank hit him in the head. Here we are. But why Eric? Because he ran off the road. He went through the plank fence. He was hit in the head with the plank. Here we are. We're not being picked on. Anyone else in this circumstance would be here. It's just what happened. But I'm hearing in my mind, I'm much bigger on the inside. I don't know if you know that. People are like, yeah, man, he talked to his mom like that. You know, I'm telling her, you know, it's, it's not time to feel sorry for us. We're in a situation here. And so in my mind, I keep hearing the natural consequences of his injuries is death. The natural consequences of his injuries is death. And so I said that to John. I said, John, the natural consequences of his injuries is death. He said, but isn't it true that the natural consequences of his accidents should have been death on impact. If the natural thing were going to happen, shouldn't it have happened on the side of the road? And it made me mad. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. He just came in and dropped something in my spirit that I hadn't considered. If the natural thing was going to happen, it should have happened on the side of the road. An opportunity had come for something other than the natural maybe to happen. Uh, the brain swelling continued. His feet began to turn in. His extremities were becoming cold. The neurologist came out and said, we need to do a nuclear scan. And what that does is determine the amount of blood flowing to the brain. He has all the signs of brain death. And said, we, we need to... We need to do this nuclear scan. We need to turn off these, this machine. And we need to let you find folks, get out of here and go do what you have to do. And so we can send it to the nuclear scan. Before they took him down, we went by his bedside. Uh, my sister was crying and said goodbye. And I said, no, 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 no. See you later. Because they were very sure. Hours passed. Dr. Deborah Blades walked into the room and she said, it's been 21 years this March, and she said exactly this. There is a minimal amount of blood flowing to his brain. It is not enough to sustain him. But it is enough that we legally have to continue to treat him, I'm sorry. And she turned and she walked off. It's exactly what she said. But something began to stir in my spirit. A minimal amount of blood is flowing to the brain. And I began to think there's life in the blood. There's life in the blood. There's life in the blood. That night I was standing by his bedside and, and um, 
one of the nurses, they had top-notch nurses back there in, in neurosurgery. And she came back there, and, and I said, did you hear about his nuclear scan? She said, Tom, I did. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They wore T-shirts around there. It said, miracles happen. And I said, you believe a miracle can happen when there's one chance in 100? I said, I believe a miracle can happen when there's no chance in 100. And I looked at that nurse, and I said, do not be surprised what may happen. I said, you may look at, into this corner and light may be over this bed. Some, you know, just don't be surprised. And she looked at me like he's, he's in denial. He doesn't understand the severity of it. I was not in denial, but something had begun to stir in my spirit. That night as I was standing for the first time, really, that week, I opened my Bible. And I was standing outside of Eric's uh, door, and there was a double door that led to his unit. And in the crack of the door, I could see his bed. This 18-year-old boy laying there fighting for his life. And, and as I was standing there and I was looking, I began to say, I rebuke death off Eric Hall. I rebuke death off Eric Hall. I rebuke death off Eric Hall. I loosen life on Eric Hall. I loosen life on Eric Hall. I began to speak this as I was standing there with my Bible open, and I'd been reading some Scripture. And all of a sudden, I was, I was not standing there anymore. And, and I was standing inside of two double doors, and there was this aisleway in front of me, and they were seating to the right and to the left. And, and in front and center, there was this beautiful bench, this beautiful... Uh, it, it, I, I knew, I could sense I, it was a courtroom. And I'm looking, and from behind that bench, there's a light. And I mean, it wasn't a, a, just a bright light, but it was a pure light. It was, it's hard to describe it, but it was so pure. And, and not just bright, it was pure. And, and I knew it had to be God. And as I was looking at this light, this man stood up in the front left uh, of, of the room, and he's very nicely dressed, very businesslike. And he stood and he said, Your Honor, I make a motion that Eric Hall shall die. He has been injured beyond what any human being should be able to be healed or be able to recover. The natural consequences of his injuries is death. I've been hearing that all week. The natural consequences of his injuries is death. And he spoke it. And I knew it was the devil. A man stood up front right. And when that man stood up from that pure light, there came a voice. And the voice said, is there not anyone here to plead for this boy's life? And when he said that, Jesus, who had stood up front, turned halfway and extended his left arm to me. And I walked up that aisle and I stood beside of Christ. And he said, your honor, my father, we make a motion for life. I'd like to tell you that overnight, man, we checked him out and took him home. No, no. I said, I'd like to tell you. I said, I'd like to tell you. I'd like to tell you. We fought. It's one of the greatest battles I've ever fought in my life. Fought fear, grief, fact. Fact, did you know that fact can be opposite of faith? Fact is a hard thing to overcome, natural fact. We fought and we fought and we fought. Let me fast forward a little bit. Day 30. The doctor, Deborah Blades, comes out. A lot of his brain swelling, he made it through the brain swelling, but on day 30, the doctor comes out and she says, Well, I think this boy may live. Uh, however, no, 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 I'm sorry. This was uh, the second week. He endured the brain swelling. The tissue had gone down. His eyes that were dilated and fixed uh, went back uh, to normal. First this side because that brain had been removed, part of that. And then this one. And then, um, but he was in a coma. He was still in a coma. Nothing was happening. On, on, and Dr. Blades had come out and she said, I think this boy may live, but he'll never open his eyes. He'll never walk. He'll never talk. He'll never move a finger. He'll never, he'll, he'll never be anything but what you see him. 
She said, we're going to have to discuss long-term coma care. And the battle continued to rage. We continued to rage. On that day, I went back to the Lord in prayer, and Dr. Blade said he'll never walk. And I said, God, I petition that he will walk. Dr. Blade said he will never talk. I said, I petition that he will talk. I petition, she said he'll never uh, move a finger. I petitioned that his hands would come back. He'd never speak, you know, he'd never see, he'd never open his eyes. And I just made a counter petition to everything that the doctor had said. And, I, and as I was in prayer making this counter petition uh, at this time, suddenly again I was not there and I was standing this time right in front of the judge's bench. And Jesus was beside me but on the left side. And when I stood there at the judge's bench and this pure light is just right here and uh, But I looked on the bench, and the prayer I had just prayed was tangible, written, laying on the bench, laying on the judge's bench. And it may sound cheesy to you, but I'm telling you, it was written in red. And it was everything that I'd said. The doctor said he will not walk. I petitioned he will walk. It was all printed out. It was tangible, laying on the desk of God, laying there. And as I stood there and I was looking at this, the voice from that light spoke again. And he said, what is the evidence? He said, I have received your petition. What is the evidence that you submit that I may grant this petition? And so I stood a moment and I turned to Christ and I asked him to turn his back to the bench. And I turned and I reached up because he's a little taller than I am. And I pulled the robe off of his back. And I'm telling you, from the bottom of his neck, all the way, low on his back, scar over scar over scar over scar. Looked more to me like a man that had been burned, not beaten. And you could see where the cat of nine tails must have cut deeper in some places and not as deep in others. He was so scarred. And I said, Your Honor, 1 Peter 2.24 says that by his stripes... We are healed. We were healed. And I said, are these stripes evidence enough for my brother's miracle, or or are they here in vain? And I was back in the hospital. Day 30, I was standing by his bed, and I held his hand, and I said, Eric, if you can hear me, squeeze my hand, and he squeezed my hand. 30 days, day and night. You cannot imagine this battle, the exhaustion. But he squeezed my hand, and I ran, and I got a nurse. I said, he squeezed my hand, he squeezed my hand. She said, oh, that's, that's just a reflex. I'm sure he squeezed your hand, but it's just a reflex. I said, we have been here 30 days. We've had nothing but bad news. We've had no hope, no good news. Nothing has happened. He squeezed my hand. I don't give a flying flip if it's a reflex. <laughs> or if he has squeezed my hand. I said, I just got something, and I'm going to take it. Yeah. See, there was an opportunity for me to say, oh, it was just a reflex and walk away. Like, oh, he's no better. But I took what I got. It wasn't much, but I got it. Long story short, it comes uh, right after he had squeezed my hand. uh, Several hours, four or five uh, hours later, Dr. Blades came in. She said, I don't know uh, what to tell you, but his liver is metabolizing the pentobarbital. He said, uh, she said, I... I guess the easiest way to say it is that his body's eating it like candy. And said his, lo- his coma levels are uh, coming up. And she said, what, I don't know what we're going to get, but ready or not, here he comes. Later in the day, Eric's eyes opened. And there was panic on his face. Fear. Some ways it got harder when his expression came. The kid knew he was in trouble. I don't know how long he had been laying there hearing conversation or, or trying to open his eyes. But when he opened his eyes, he did not close them for three days. And, uh, you know, this thing continues on. We eventually got out of it, the intensive care. We went to a regular room. We eventually got out of a regular room. They took, he had a permanent trach that they were able to wean him off of and take him uh, off of that. And it le- has left a permanent scar Uh, And we were able to take him from University of Kentucky Hospital to Cardinal Hill Rehab Center. And he went completely strapped in a wheelchair from his chest, his arms, everything. The goal was to teach him how to live life from a wheelchair. 
Not an easy thing even to consider. We got to Cardinal Hill, and, um, and they began to work with them. And in a little while, you know, they come bouncing in one day. They said, we're going to get them to a walker. I just believe we're going to be able to get them to a walker. I said, man, this, is, this thing's going somewhere. About nine weeks had passed. I had come into Cardinal Hill one day, and, and Eric was sitting in, in his wheelchair, and he was eating in the cafeteria, and I had not heard his voice ever. He hadn't said anything for nine weeks. And I walked in, and I said, how's the food? He said, need salt. <laughs> First things I heard him say in nine weeks, need salt. They came back later, and they said, we're going to get him to a cane. We're going to get him to a cane. Eric graduated with his graduating class in June. We took him there in a wheelchair so he wouldn't tire. They didn't bring his name out alphabetically. They kept it to the last. Two of his friends stood beside him as they brought him out of the wheelchair, and he walked with their help to the center of the stage to get his diploma. People stood to their feet and cheered. And it was so awesome, my daughter, Megan, just a young child, she looked up and she said to her mother, she said, Mommy, they're worshiping. It was such an atmosphere. Eric came home. He walks, he talks, and talks, and talks. <laughs> Remember, we drafted him in, right? He has full use of both hands. Arms, eyes, feet, legs. The only lingering effect is his concentration is short enough that he's not able to work. He uh, draws a disability check. He's had one child since the accident. His son is now the father of twin boys and a 20-month-old girl. Eric is a grandfather. At 39 years old. A year after he got out of the hospital, I took him to Dr. Blades. And he walked into that room and she looked up at him. And uh, she began to talk about it. She said, you've got to understand, I took a chunk out of this boy's brain and I threw it in the trash. She said, when the rest of his brain sends signals to that area, it, it should, she patted the block wall behind her. She said, it should be like it hits a wall of brick and, and, and it just bounces around his brain. He should be in an utter state of confusion, an utter state of confusion. She said, Tom, if Eric was at home in a wheelchair drooling out of his mind, he would be a miracle. She said that he can walk and talk and that he knows your name. She said, the area of the brain that had your name in it, I threw away. And she said, I don't know how to describe this, except that when the brain is sending signals to that area, it's getting answers. Yeah. 